So this is the third week in which we continue exploring the book of Esther. The book of Esther is one of five small books that are usually kept in one scroll, and each of those books is read at least once during the Jewish year. The book of Esther is not often studied in depth in the Protestant church, but it's an important story, a folk tale with historical overlay, but also a deep message about faith and hope. Now, the last two weeks, we looked at Esther 1 and Esther 2. The story now takes up, uh, picks up speed a bit, and so we're going to hear verses from four different chapters, from 3, 4, 5, and 7. And I'll offer a few words of commentary around each, but you can follow along. First reading from chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. And this involves an advisor to the Persian king Ahasuerus, a man named Haman, who's the villain in the story. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So having been told who Mordecai's people were, namely that they were Jewish, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And so in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, which means the lot, before Haman for the day and for the month, and the lot fell on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. All right, pause for a second. So Haman has this position of power that requires everyone to bow down to him. But Mordecai, being a, a, a Jewish person of faith, refuses to bow down, similar to Daniel refusing to bow down in the ancient other stories. This leads to a blind hatred in Haman that prompts him to actually move from Mordecai to write a decree to have all the Jews killed in a genocide. To determine when the day of genocide was to occur, they cast dice, or lots, called a poor. And he chooses, by doing this, a day in the last month of the year. But recognize, he's doing this on the first month of the year. So basically, the decree will go out, and the Jewish people will have to live for a year with the knowledge that they will all be killed in the last month. Also, Mordecai hears of this decree, and he sits outside the king's gate and begins to lament publicly. And that's where the next chapter takes off. Chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. So Mordecai also gave a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for the destruction of the Jews, that he might show it to Esther, that he might explain it to her and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him, to entreat him for her people. Now, Hattach, that's one of Esther's servants, Hattach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hattach and gave him a message for Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court of the palace without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live, may they approach. I myself have not been called to come to the king for 30 days. Well, when they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silence at such a time as this, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. But who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Now at this point, Esther has to think, what are her options? And she asks for all the Jewish people, she sends forth a command that they should all fast as she creates a plan to find a way to come before the king safely and make a request for clemency. That happens in chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, side note, Esther then calls a banquet to invite Haman and the king together to make this request. So this is Haman's reaction. Haman added, well, even Queen Esther let no one but me 
Come with the king to the banquet that she prepared. Tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king. Yet all this does me no good so long as I see the Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. So then Haman's wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the banquet in good spirits. And this advice pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. All right, now the story takes an ironic turn and an exaggerated turn, but basically Haman is so mean-spirited that he both boasts about being invited to the banquet and then is grumpy that Mordecai still lives and thinks he'll feel better if he kills Mordecai on the way to a banquet. It doesn't make a lot of sense morally, but that was his plan. So we get to the conclusion, chapter 7, with Esther's banquet. This is the second banquet she's offered them, by the way. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition? What is your request? Queen Esther, it shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. And then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given me, that is my petition, and the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we'd been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this type of damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who is presumed to do this? And Esther says, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the story then moves to the irony that Haman himself ends up being hung on the gallows he had built to supposedly kill Mordecai. So this story and its part are all parts of the words of God given to us for our wisdom and our peace. Thanks be to God. Each week we've paired the reading from Esther with a reading from the last chapter of the book of Proverbs. It's a chapter that speaks about women, in particular about a capable wife with words of praise and wisdom. And so here once more these verses from chapter 31 of Proverbs. A capable wife who can find she is more precious than jewels. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Many women have done excellently. But you surpass them all. Let us pray. Loving God, once more from generations past come to us words of faith and scripture. May we learn from the example and from the witness, and may the words bear fruit in our lives. So may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the hinge of the entire book of Esther is found in chapter 4, and on that hinge, swings a door of fate, one that will either open to a story of salvation and hope, or one that will slam shut with the death of Esther and Mordecai and all the Jewish people in the Persian kingdom. The gullible king Ahasuerus has been bamboozled by Haman to issue a decree calling for the genocide of all Jewish people living in his realm. Mordecai then tells Esther about this decree, and he warns her that she won't be safe within the palace walls if Haman's edict is allowed to stand. And then Mordecai says to her the famous words that have launched a thousand sermons. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Mordecai knows that Esther needs to act. Now, Mordecai could have shaped his request 
out of family loyalty, saying, Esther, I raised you all of these years like a father. Do this out of respect for me. Or he could have tried to guilt her into action, saying, Esther, after all I've done for you, will you do nothing and let Haman destroy all of us? Mordecai could have criticized her and somehow tried to coerce her into action, saying, Esther has all your fancy clothes and harem jewelry made you forget where you come from? Don't think that you can hide behind the palace walls. It's an interesting back and forth that's captured in chapter 4 between this man and his one-time ward. But think about it. Esther has to process this information about a genocide literally right there on the spot. And she already knows the rules of the royal court. No one is allowed to approach the king unbidden. And she clearly can see that if she does what Mordecai is proposing, it will be risky, if not life-threatening, for her. But into this tense back and forth between Mordecai and Esther, Mordecai has subtly introduced the idea of God's hand being at work in this entire drama. The decree has been sent out. The door now leading to a possible genocide has been swung open. So the question is, where is God in all of this? Perhaps, just perhaps, maybe Esther, the Jewish girl now queen of the realm, has been brought to high honor for just such a time as this. Now, it's precisely at this moment of the story where preachers want you, as listeners, to stand right beside Esther and to ask, have I been in a situation where an action from me could have changed things for the better? Usually preachers will remind you of others whose actions at the right time literally changed history. Rosa Parks refusing to get up from her Montgomery bus seat. Or Martin Luther King Jr., a young pastor in Montgomery who agrees to now lead the bus boycott. Or Nelson Mandela, stepping out of the prison doors at Robben Island and soon literally stepping into the presidential suite in Pretoria, South Africa. Or young people like Greta Thunberg calling her strike from school to protest climate change and environmental disaster or Malala Yousafzai, who broke her silence around honor, kinging, honor killing in order to speak up against the abuse of women. God used all of those people in their particular moments of history to affect, if not to even change, history. They acted bravely in such a time as they endured. But then I would wager that most of us are saying to ourselves, I'm not Rosa, or Martin, or Nelsa, Nelson, or Greta, or Malala. I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I'm a social worker. I'm part of a staff of a nonprofit. I'm, I'm an employee of a big corporation. Or I'm retired. I'm just trying to pay my monthly bills. I've got a bad back. I'm not good at public speaking. I hate conflict. I don't have time to join another committee. So. Don't compare me to Esther. I'm happy to celebrate her courage. I'm happy to hear her story, but I'm no Queen Esther. That's how most of us react if we're invited to stand beside Esther and we're told to act boldly for such a time as this. And so that's why the next step in a lot of sermons, including ones I've preached, are to redefine what it means to act boldly to shift the focus away from one dramatic gesture to then encourage you to do a thousand small deeds of faithfulness. One preacher, Fred Craddock, has said that it's not like God is asking you to plop down a $10,000 bill, but rather God is asking you to take that $10,000 bill to the bank and exchange it for rolls of quarters and then to go through life putting down 25 cents or 50 cents here and there, listening 
to a neighbor instead of walking away, visiting a shaky old friend in a nursing home, attending yet another committee meeting and accepting a task, or saying a prayer for someone you know is struggling. He said that giving our life to God is actually lots of little deeds that we do for times like this. And that's a true analogy. It's a true approach. Because lots of little deeds of kindness and justice can change lives and, taken together, can change history itself. There's another popular preaching story about a World War II pilot who was doing a bombing run over Kassel, Germany, when his plane was hit by anti-aircraft bullets and shrapnel. And some of the shrapnel literally punctured his fuel tanks. But amazingly, the plane didn't explode and he could land safely. The next day, the repair crew opened up the fuel tank and found inside of it 11 unexploded shells, where even if one of them had exploded, it would have blown the plane from the sky. When they examined these shells, these shrapnel bullets, none of them contained an explosive charge. Instead, they found inside one of them a small piece of rolled up paper with a message written in check. And when they translated the note, the note simply said, this is all we can do for you now. So speaking personally, I think it's important to lift up both types of faithful actions. The actions of Czech resistance fighters creating blank bullets in war, or the Good Samaritan who does literally hundreds of small acts of kindness but also to lift up the dramatic examples of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Greta Thunberg. A lot will depend on where God has placed you in the first place. So maybe for such a time as this means listening to a coworker who is struggling. Or maybe it means taking the risk of filing a report as a whistleblower for the unsafe and unethical practices where you and the coworker both are employed. Maybe it means taking the time to get a vaccination shot or to make sure you vote. Or maybe it means setting up a clinic for vaccinations in underserved areas. Or maybe it means running for office yourself. Like Edmund Burke said a long time ago, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. God calls us and places us where we can do something, maybe small or maybe more dramatic, but something to thwart the power and authority of evil. But how do we know? How do we know if the actions that we're considering are truly righteous? How do we know if this is the time to act? And that's where this story of Esther is so valuable. Not because chapter 4 has this back-and-forth conversation between Mordecai and Esther, but because the story contrasts Esther with Haman. Haman and his actions are antithetical to the ways of faith. Haman is vain. He is so vain that he demands all people must bow down to him. And when one person, Mordecai, refuses, he literally drafts a decree to have the entire Jewish race killed. Haman is cruel. He casts lots to decide when this pogrom is going to occur. And when it's going to happen 12 months later, he rejoices that the people will have a year to know their fate. Haman is boastful. He boasts to his family how only he and the king were invited to the special banquet of Esther's, and he's mean-spirited, somehow believing that, well, he'll digest his food better if Mordecai is hung on the gallows before he goes to the banquet. Now realize, all of those same options were available to Esther. When Mordecai's message came to her, she could have been vain. She could have said, I'm now queen. I can't be bothered to worry with my kinsman's problems. She could have been cruel, insisting that any action he suggested was going to put herself at risk and it wasn't worth considering. And she could have been mean-spirited too, hiding behind the palace walls while others suffered and died. 
But in the story, it's clear. Esther, Esther doesn't act like Haman. She listened to another's plea. She was persuaded to act, even if it was risky. And most importantly, Esther owned her true identity, accepting that she was a Jewish woman and a child of God. And that's seen most clearly in that climactic scene when they're finally around the banquet table and she makes her request to the king when she says, let my life be given to me and the life of my people. That is my request. See, ever since that fateful door swung open and Haman's plot was revealed, Esther has changed. Esther now takes charge. The girl raised by Mordecai is now fully a queen who acts. She orders her people to have a fast as she thinks through her options, to humble themselves that they might together still have hope. And then she plans two banquets to first show her devotion to her husband. And then when she makes her request, it's not just for herself, not just for her own safety, but for all of her people. It wasn't an act of self-interest, but an act calling for justice for the meek and for the oppressed. The power behind the phrase, for such a time as this, is that it calls us to take a larger perspective on life, to lift our heads and look beyond the immediate moment and imagine how this moment literally fits into a lifetime. And when we raise our eyes off our own situation and we look to the broader horizon and all the people before us, what we do is see those who are also affected just as we are. And that was the power of Queen Esther as opposed to Haman. Now in that moment, there may be random acts of kindness that you will be called to do. There may be moments of resistance in wartime to protect those on the side of righteousness. There may be those who are prophetic leaders who push back against racism and sexism and environmental degradation. But whatever is done in all of those moments, remember, is done for us and for others, for all people, friend and stranger, neighbor and the distant refugee, those known and those unknown, yet loved by God. In Christ Jesus, we discover our true identity as descendants of Queen Esther, as redeemed disciples, followers of Christ, who stand beside Peter and Thomas and Mary Magdalene, and as members of a global family of God who have been placed right where we are for such a time as this. So go ahead and stand by Queen Esther. Let your requests be known to God and to the world. And may you offer her words this day and in the days to come. May life be given to me and all people. A life of justice, of righteousness, of food and shelter, of family, a life of peace. It is for that message God has placed us where we are for such a time as this. Thanks be to God. Amen.